Hey there everybody, AJ back for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. This is an interesting request on the subject of famous wizards. Those who have uh, ha have their name attached to spells they are credited with either inventing or were known for using almost to the exclusion of other magics. One wizard everyone who plays in the setting of Forgotten Realms should know is Carsis, known by the elves as the child who would be God, the unmaker of the weave and the ape who could who would fly. Born in minus 696 Dale Reckoning, Carsis was a natural genius, able to cast his first spell by the age of two, the youngest wizard ever to create his own floating city, built on the flipped and levitated, sheared off peak of a mountain, as was the fashion in the ancient human empire of Netheril. Chaotic neutral and arrogant as hell, Carsis uh, saw no limit to human potential. He had little regard for warnings about so-called taboo magical research. He attracted followers and founded a school that was responsible for a lot of the magic concerning the plane of shadow, which overcame a lot of the skeptics by sheer dint of the shadow creatures being such convenient slave laborers and the shadow fell being such a great place to dump troublesome garbage. For years, thanks to the prophecy, uh, a prophecy Carthus misunderstood, as is often the case, becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy as a result, Carsis developed a spell called Carsis's Avatar. In minus 339 DR, note Carsis was already 357 years old and in his prime, thanks to magic, he cast the spell, which was well past the limitation of ninth level magic. It was so complex, Carsis had to put a stone, uh, the put a stone-filled gizzard of a gold dragon into a mixture of Tarrasque blood and 12-headed Hydra bile just to enchant one of the material components. It had a casting time of 6 hours, but it had taken him 10 years to develop through hard research and brilliant deduction. With it, he temporarily merged his entire being with that of a god. Unfortunately, he chose Mistral, the goddess of magic. Perhaps things could have been different, but the result was that Mistral sacrificed herself and reincarnated incarnated almost immediately as Mistra, magic temporarily overcharged to twice its normal power then shut off completely, and the last thing Cassus saw before he became petrified into a gleaming red stone was the nearly complete destruction of his entire civilization. Thus, it is known to this day as Cassus's folly. Tarsus was spurned by every god and denied access to the fugue plane when he died. Instead, his soul was bound to the material plane. Those with experience in pact magic can call up his vestige, where he appears as a gold, uh, giant blood-red boulder, or bubbling, um, bubbling with blood. He grants a boost in magical ability, but with a taint of seething arrogance. Next, we have Tensor also known as Manzorian, the wizard level 16 archmage level 5, one of the two characters that, um, one of the first two characters that played the game now known as Dungeons and Dragons, ever. Tensor is medium sized, with brown hair and an aquiline nose, he is always dressed in blue. He's polite and outgoing, but is willing to enforce his will on others for the sake of law and good. While the spells Tensor's Transformation and Tensor's Floating Disc are named after him, it is not widely known that Tensor also invented the spell Cone of Cold. Tensor was a very accomplished and wealthy adventurer at the end of his career, which concentrated heavily on the dungeons below uh, Castle Greyhawk and the surrounding lands of the Flanass in the world of Uyth. Uyth. <coughs> I never like saying Uyth. Morden Kanan, who trained the young apprentice Bigby, Morden Kanan, was a powerful wizard who um, is often described as a one-man peacekeeping force, a proponent of the philosophies of true neutrality. I like to think of Morden Kanan as the uh, Greyhawk version of uh, our minster. Morden Kanan, the Archmage, formed the Circle of Eight as a tool to manipulate political factions of the Flanes, preserving the delicate balance of power in hopes of maintaining stability and sanity in the region. His view of enforced neutrality is not a tit-for-tat equality, but rather a detailed theoretical um, philosophy derived from decades of arcane research. He has fought ardently for the forces of good, and most recently during the Greyhawk Wars, but just as often has worked on darker plots to achieve his ends. So, true neutral. Morden Kane appears much younger than his years, perhaps in his mid-40s. He is, was tall, of medium build, and often depicted wearing black, blue, or grey. He shaved his head and wore a goatee beard trimmed to a point. He was stubborn and difficult and did not tolerate fools. He spent a lot of time listening rather than talking, but when he did talk in a deep and melodic voice, his pronouncements were authoritative 
and rarely questioned. He is distantly related to Heward, Zagig, and Bigby. The latter was one at, at one point Mordenkainen's apprentice. Mordenkainen is an associate of Elminster of the Forgotten Realms during um, a setting and the uh, and Delamar of the Dragonlance setting, who all meet on Earth to swap news and magic. He is also stated to have an apprentice named uh, Ruathine. In, uh, he contributed many spells, and some of the most complex to master, among them the commonly known spells Mordenkainen's Magnificent Mansion, Mordenkainen's Faithful Hound, and Mordenkainen's Disjunction. Mordenkainen is also known to have co-authored um, or authored the following books. Architecture with Lemond, The Codex of Mordenkainen, Cosmogony of Magnetic Fluids, Dark Sides of Memory, Epic Saga of the Great Conjurers, On the Rise of Magecraft and Modernity, Weapons of the Ether with Nelf. As one of the first characters played by Gary Gygax, Mordenkainen's career literally shaped the game of Dungeons and Dragons for all future spellcasters, and most certainly deserves to be uh, preserved and honoured in our spell lists, I think. Rary of Ket is a powerful archmage and ruler of the Brightlands. Rary was described as a man of mixed Bucklanish and Sewell stock, uh, six feet tall, 170 pounds of auburn hair, bright green eyes and a tan complexion who favours tan robes with intricate gold patterns. His personality is given as thoughtfully contemplative. Um, apparently he dislikes those who act foolishly or rashly and Otteluk was a particular target of his scorn, though even Morden Kainan is characterised as too volatile for Rary's tastes. Rary's mnemonic enhancer and Rary's, telepath Rary's telepathic bond are certainly his most famous spells, but a whole slew of psychic spells or mental powers have been attributed to his works, including Rary's ap aptitude appropriator, Rary's arcane conversion, Rary's empathic perception, Rary's interplanar telepathic bond, Rary's memory alteration, Rary's mind scan, Rary's mind shield, Rary's plain truth, Rary's protection from scrying, Rary's replay of the past, Rary's spell enhancer, Rary's superior spell enhancer, Rary's utterance, uh, urgent utterance, and his most well, well distributed and reproduced books are Arcane Puissance, Pu Puissance of the Memory. The Lost Spellbook of Rary the Traitor, where many of his spells are listed above, are found. <clears throat> As you can tell from the title of that last book, Rary did some bad things. But his overall intentions were not evil, just the things he did to achieve his goals could be pretty heinous. Nistal developed the spells Nistal's Magical Aura, Nistal's Undetectable Aura, Nistal's uh, Black Light Burst, Nistal's Black Moat, Nistal's Blazing Beam, Nistal's Crystal Dagger, Nistal's Crystal Dirk, Nistal's Dancing Duoma, uh, Nistal's Dancing Wear Light, Nistal's Enveloping Darkness, Nistal's Expedious Fire Extinguisher, Nistal's Flash, Nistal's Golden Revelation, Nistal's Gru Conjuration, Nistal's Light Burst, Nistal's Radiant Arch, Nistal's Radiant Baton, um, and he authored Librum of the Great Paravisual Emanations and Metaphysics of Mathematics. He was the most famous of the native uh, native of the Duchy of Tenth, and <coughs> an archmage, member of the Circle of Eight, and a powerful cabal of wizards um, who are based in Flanders, with Morden Kane being in charge as the ninth wizard. Um, other than that, I don't really know much about him. Melf is not Melf's actual name, but a simple version he went by in human lands. He was actually Prince Brightflame, a grey elven archmage, leader of the Knights of Luna. He was 5'8", 147 pounds, and about 200 years old, appearing in his late 20s in human terms. He changed his appearance from time to time, although he always appeared as an elf. Prince Brightflame was a strong believer in mediation, diplomacy, and open communication, was charming, and loved wine, women, and song, and fine culture. His vast knowledge and experience was highly respected, though he specialised in the evil god Ayus, uh, buried evils, and was strongly opposed to both Ayus and the Scarlet Brotherhood. Melf was an ally of Mordenkainen, carried the holy symbol of uh, Lagan, and was a cousin of Queen Yolandi of uh, Selene. Aside from being a well-travelled and respected friend of many noble houses, Melf was a wizard, and he wrote the treatise of Universal Astronomy and co-authored Weapons of the Ether with Mordenkainen. Along with Melf's acid er arrow, he also created Melf's Unicorn Arrow and Melf's Minute Meteors. 
fun note if you google, google the name uh Perile, the action figure that is actually melf um that action figure is is melf himself melf himself tasha's hideous laughter well this spell was actually created by one of the greatest villains in dungeons and dragons history Igwilf, a selfish evil magic user with a craving for ever increasing power and a penchant for sexual manipulation during her adventuring days she traveled under the alias of tasha that's why the spell's got that name the demononicons she wrote are justifiably famous and few are aware she is actually the adopted daughter of baba yaga herself she imprisoned and seduced the demon lord grast and is the mother of Ayus. she was at one time the apprentice of zagig ragirin her career is famous and pivotal for mo so many events all i can manage here is a brief introduction but i could probably uh, i could refer to her as the crone said to be her true form and the other a human female of dark beauty in the latter form um Igwilf has long black hair and pale skin and it said that none who have seen her in her true crone form still live she has many alternate names on earth she is called the witch queen of Perin, Perinland and the mother of witches she is known as Lauhi on one um, alternate prime material plane world and as Yichbilch on another those close to her sometimes address her as Wilva she is a master manipulator of infernal politics and one woman I would advise your characters to never get involved with under any circumstances I would say that Igwilf is actually a demigod at this point and probably authored uh, far more spells under many different identities but we just don't know Leomund also known as Leomund the Red an elusive figure that always kept his whereabouts circumspect he developed spells such as Leomund's Hidden La uh, Lodge Leomund's Lamentable Bell label bell <laughs> belablement lehman's secret chest lehman's secret uh, secure shelter lehman's tiny hut and lehman's trap he co-authored and authored and co-authored architecture with morton Cain, forgotten arts of oratory magnetism thesis on the planes of antimatter and transcendental impenetrabilities lehmond is creator of lehmond's plate and cup um, a magical item made of engraved silver gold or platinum these finely crafted dishes produce delicious meals and alcoholic drinks on command at variable frequencies frequencies per day depending on the nature of the item after use they must be cleaned with sweet or holy water once a week or permanently stop functioning i always imagined him to be a bit like an alternate universe version of rincewind from the disc world uh, except rincewind that achieved his full potential instead of having his life ruined by that spell of creation that got lodged in his brain anyway red robes athletic disposition keen researcher and expert in special spatial magic probably capable of building a tardis if you ask me evard the black um, an enemy of morden canaan who lived in the sheldemar valley where he dealt as an information broker a man of sturdy build and average musculature with uh, pale skin and long dark hair he wore rich clothing often belted with a white sash and a large purple gemstone hung from his throat he was a charming man with a ready grin Evard was originally a minor noble in the march of Bissell he came to be a very successful broker of information and many sages and law masters sent him uh, knowledge in return for solving vexing questions of their own if he didn't know something someone in his network would he was ambitious and cunning and would readily betray his allies if it suited him he could be found in many any of the major cities of the Sheldemar. in addition to the commonly known spell Evard's black tentacles Evard also developed the following spells uh, Evard's all-seeing worm and Evard's menacing tentacles Evard is known to have authored the book uh, legendary uh, legendary of phantoms and ghosts that's the name of the book Otluk stood just over five feet tall he had short black hair a thin beard and brown watery eyes he was well dressed but appeared rather puny small and weak and one of the few humans who could wear a magical item called gauntlets of cobalt power and have it actually benefit him tremendously <laughs> okay now that's just hilarious i want that item in my game odd luke was not a wise man either he had a wisdom of eight he was of all modern canaan's allies the least endowed with common sense mentally he was brilliant a match for tensor and bigby and sheer intellectual power and prowess but some of those his ideas were a few tankards short of a keg so of course he was something of a politician uh, um <clears throat> president of gay greyhawks uh city society of mad guy and uh, a member of the city's directing oligarchy he is responsible for the following spells this is quite a quite a long list otoluk's freezing sphere or otoluk's icy sphere 
Otto Luke's resilient sphere, Otto Luke's telekinetic sphere. Otto Luke bases a number of his creations on spheres, orbs, bubbles, um, or screens mixed with elemental forces. He has also developed the following additional spells Otto Luke's acid cloud, Otto Luke's boiling oil bath, Otto Luke's bubbling buoyancy, Otto Luke's death screen, Otto Luke's diamond screen, Otto Luke's dispelling screen, Otto Luke's electrical screen, Otto Luke's excruciating screen. Odd Luke's Fire and Ice, Odd Luke's Force Umbrella, Odd Luke's Greater Dispelling Screen, Odd Luke's Orb of Containment, Odd Luke's Polar Screen, Odd Luke's Radiant Screen, Odd Luke's Siege Sphere, Odd Luke's Smoky Sphere, Odd Luke's Screaming Sphere, Odd Luke's Suppressing Field, and he wrote Gazette on the Norse Climates, Odd Luke's Practical Gardening, and Spherogenesis of the Multiverses. Boy, I'd like to read that last one. He also created a mage bred cross between um, a giant wasp and a carnivorous monkey called a howler wasp to protect his home from a cabal of sladi. But he lost control of them and they went off into the wild to be a breed like crazy. Yet, yeah, good one. Just like give all wizards a bad name. Why don't you? Bigby made his name in Scant, capital of Onwall, and later resided in Mitrick, uh, Valuna. He actually started out being evil but after getting into a fight with and being defeated by a charm spell thrown masterfully by Morden Kanan, Bigby eventually gave up his evil ways and became a loyal apprentice to the Archmage. Huh. Eventually Bigby became a powerful Archmage himself and when last depicted Bigby was 58 years old, stood 5 foot 11 feet tall, um, being extremely gaunt, weighs only 190, um, 149 pounds and bears light brown hair, brown eyes, and iridium facial features despite his pale skin. He is depicted as quiet, introverted, and soft-spoken, and appears perpetually nervous and overcautious about everything. I think we should be care very careful about what we're about to do, is his pet phrase. His characterization also focuses on his puritanical and, aesthet um, and aesthet aesthetic views, making him one to eschew pleasures of the flesh. At some point, a large statue of Bigby was constructed in the otherworldly city of Sigil, though it is far from clear how this came to be. I can imagine why. The list of spells attributed to Bigby is impressive by anyone's measure. They include Bigby's clenched fist, Bigby's crushing hand, Bigby's forceful hand, Bigby's grasping hand, Bigby's interposing hand, Bigby's disrupting hand, Bigby's helpful hand, Bigby's striking fist. You can see the theme going on there. But wait, there's more. I'm just going to get to the next page. <clears throat> Bigby's tripping hand, Bigby's warding hand, Bigby's battering gauntlet, Bigby's besieging bolt, Bigby's bookworm bane, Bigby's construction crew, Bigby's dexterous digits, Bigby's fantastic fences, Bigby's fing feeling fingers, Bigby's force sculpture, Bigby's most excellent force sculpture, Bigby's pugnacious pugilist, Bigby's silencing hand, Bigby's slapping hand, Bigby's strangling grip, and Bigby's superior force sculpture. So, force sculpture. He is the author of the book Manual Powers Beyond Life. Drawmage is reputed to live in an underwater fortress beneath the Azure Sea. His hair is sandy blonde and his eyes are so blue that they're nearly purple. He stands six feet tall and weighs 172 pounds. His features possess an undefinable, unsettling quality, and more than a few of those who know him have perceived something subtly different about him each time they meet. The shade of his eyes, his height, even the thickness and curl of his hair. Rarely calls these his troubling inconsistencies. Drawmage wears magical robes of cool colours, favouring um, favoring elven designs, and for the last decade or so, Drawmage has focused his theories on chronomancy, magic involving the manipulation of time. He has grown increasingly eccentric of late. For this reason, I'm not referring to him in the past tense, for all I know, he's skipping around time and may show up at any minute. Drawmage is responsible for developing the commonly known spell Drawmage Instance, Drawmage's Instant Summons. But uh, Drawmage uh, has also developed the following additional spells. Drawmage, Drawmage's Adventurer's Luck, Drawmage's Beast of Burden, Drawmage's Beneficent Polymorph, Drawmage's Breath of Life, Drawmage's Flying Feet, Drawmage's Handy Timepiece, Drawmage's Instant Exit, Drawmage's Iron Sack, Drawmage's Light Step, Drawmage's Marvelous Shield, Drawmage's Merciful Metamorphosis, Drawmage's Protection from Non-Magical Gas, Drawmage's Scent Mask, Drawmage's Swift Mount, and Drawmage's Toolbox. All very practical and useful spells. He also invented Drawmage's Undersea Apparatus and wrote the repertoire of illustrious conjurations. 
Okay, so you can see that all of these famous wizards are basically earlier player characters from the games of Gary Gygax, his family and friends. They are derived from the original D&D setting and it is implied that through the law, uh, that law, that magical law, wizard, wizardry spells and incantation as well as news and such are exchanged between powerful archmages who travel from different worlds, different dimensions, different realms to meet together and chat about life, the universe and everything. I hope this proves interesting and useful to you. I certainly love the history of these characters as it relates to the origin of the game itself. And if you got all this way through the video, go check out the Greyhawk uh, wiki pages for more information on, on who played these characters, what they got up to in their very early campaigns, because it's a great read. Um, they really got up to some interesting and very pivotal stuff in the history of the world of Greyhawk that was pretty much written around them. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you again soon.